Welcome to DeFi, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak to Marina Markezic, co-founder and board member of EUCI, European Crypto Initiative. Good morning, Marina. Thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Please tell us who you are and how did you get into crypto? What is your rabbit hole story? Oh, wow. Interesting. Uh, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Marina and I came into crypto because the crowd investing platform that I founded was not doing very good. And then there was a new accelerator that just opened in 2017 and I joined them. And I basically started working for um, blockchain, mainly Ethereum projects. Um, actually, th- there was a project that came to our crowd investing platform and they wanted to do a stablecoin backed by seven different um, fiat currencies and gold. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started uh, like, yeah, learning about, um, about blockchain and, and, and crypto in 2016. Um, yeah, this is the first encounter. From that, how did you end up constituting the European Crypto Initiative? So I was studying law and I was always kind of working in this um, intersection between law and business. And because we were quite early, at least from where I'm coming from, from Slovenia, uh, we were then talking to the regulators at the time already on the national level. So um, at that time there was Bitstamp, there were some other projects that were quite early with ICOs and uh, with, with crypto. Uh, development so the regulators the regulators were interested the, i think it always starts with taxes because there's a lot of like holders of crypto um and again in slovenia we have like a very high percentage of people that that are knowledgeable about crypto and hold crypto uh, you can even buy um almost everything in stores with crypto which is quite interesting and so i think that this is where it starts and then of course there were icos and all those scams and i think that regulators were quite concerned about it so we were talking to the national regulators and then i got the privilege to meet simon Porro uh, and florian gratz and they all worked in their own um of course national uh with all national regulators and they founded their own organizations in Germany and France and this is how we together formed the EUCI. At the beginning it was more like an initiative which um, basically, I don't know if you remember, but it was two years ago Mika draft leaked. So before the official uh, publishing it leaked and we saw we saw that and then we were just like talking to each other like, oh my God, this is terrible. We need to do something about it. And like, we immediately agreed that we should do something about it. We started talking to the to the regulators. Um, we were not very public about this because our main focus was really just, you know, fix Mika, <laughs> very, very short term. Uh, but then it evolved um, a little bit more. What is uh, today the European Crypto Initiative and how is it structured? Yeah, so the the name came from an initiative because the initial idea was really, okay, we'll fix Mika and then, you know, this probably will only be an initiative, a temporary thing. But then after Mika, there were so many things that came up, uh, like the email package. There's right now so many things that are happening. And basically we got the feedback from supporters, from the community. And it's also ourselves that we saw that, that something like this is needed. Basically, the European Crypto Initiative is a non-profit based in Brussels um, and it is an organization that is composed by the three founders that are the ones that I mentioned. But right now we have a team of people that are working on understanding the regulation and also giving feedback to the regulators. So in a way educating um, and um, yeah, and working also on, on educating and sharing uh, this knowledge with the community too. Uh, I think we have different communities and we need to adjust our wording and our work to all of those communities. But at the same time, we also need to be very quick in reacting to what's happening. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, also media, media very similar to this because we need to be very quick on, on Telegram and, and, and sharing this news with our comments, of course, to, to all the community. So basically the idea is to bring these values that the open source community and open blockchain um, are basically based on 
to to Brussels to the regulators to maybe uh, some people that are working in institutions that are more institutionalized and also to be honest it's really hard to get the essence of blockchain um, or to learn about it very easily in a very uh, concise manner for for especially for the ones that are not in the community so this is the the role of EUCI and at the same time of course we're backed by members we got a grant from the uh, the Ethereum Foundation we got a grant from the Interchain Foundation um, MakerDAO is our member Gnosis and some others and we're also trying to um, bring the most valuable uh, information to them and get, uh, of course, share share feedback. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned it uh, earlier. Um, what are the main takeaways from Maker? Yes. So the markets in crypto assets regulation is uh, a draft that was first issued two years ago by the European Commission, and this is how usually the this legislative process in Europe works. So the European Commission usually issues the first draft and then you read and, and it's public and you can you can understand what's happening there and then we have two other institutions the parliament and the council that also write their own draft and then the final process is the basically the the the, the compromise between all those three drafts and then we have the final version of of this document so now we have the final version of of mika of the markets and crypto assets regulation uh, which means that it is politically agreed upon. It's almost finalized. The only thing we need right now is for the lawyer jurists to take a look at it and maybe tweak some, some wording. And it will be published early next year. But what it means, it actually brings the first, I would say, also global framework, how to regulate crypto asset. So tokens, crypto, in it's it's named as crypto asset in the European legal jargon. So this is the terminology right now. And this is also very new. So right now we have legal terminology in crypto, which means that I think this is super important for the whole community, for us, of course, and, and for everyone that is working. Yeah, in this sense. So an NFT that we use as a community is different from the NFT that Mika uses. Uh, or crypto asset again, or a utility token. Those are quite different uh, different topics. But what Mika does, it regulates the issuers of crypto asset, and it regulates um, crypto asset service providers that want to offer services in Europe. So that's very important. A lot of people say, oh, if you don't like what's happening in Europe, just go to Switzerland or somewhere else. It basically regulates the access to the market. If you had to list three major problems that you usually encounter while dealing with EU regulators, what would that be? So I think it is probably a lack of time um, and then uh, a lack of uh, resources and just the, the way how the governance of, of maybe European Union is structured. So the lack of time it's very specific to specific regulation and topic, but usually, of course, the regulators don't have a lot of time to study and to understand topics, especially when they are complicated, uh, as, as, we, as we know it's in, 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 in crypto. Um, and then, of course, resources, which is connected to time. The governance process, um, sometimes we feel is not transparent enough or it's not public enough. Hmm. Um, in a way, we had this comment from the community that they would want to understand more and know more, but it was not publicly stated. So like, for example, a specific draft that could have banned um, uh, the unhosted wallet or we were talking about the ban on proof of work was not public. And that was in a way the, 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 the problem that I think we might, might need to solve. Um, and it's very interesting because usually those regulators regulate financial uh, assets and the usual citizen is not interested in financial assets or in, in banking regulation, but crypto is really bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and this is why it might be a little bit different in this case. 
Interesting. Uh, so you're basically educating the regulators. Well, you're doing it for a purpose. So what are the opportunities that you can uh, retrieve uh, in educating the, the regulators at European level? I think this is a very interesting question because when we started with our work, we basically had a presentation and talking about the decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges and what is the difference. Because there was a, an article that said that centralized exchanges need to settle the transactions on blockchain daily, which is something that they don't do and it would be very costly and inefficient if they would do that. What's also interesting is that this is also has a, an effect that might be, I don't know, uh, if we, I can say negative or positive, but it's definitely an effect. And this is that those new things that are happening are then taken into account and included in the regulation. So the result is that at the beginning in the first draft in 2020, we didn't have NFTs mentioned. We didn't have anything regarding algorithmic stablecoins mentioned. But um, due to circumstances that happened in the last months, those two are now mentioned. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and they are they are a part of markets and crypto assets regulation, which is also very interesting because some of the proposals that we see in the US, like the stablecoin bill, they also have algorithmic stablecoins mentioned. So thanks to Luna and thanks to some not very positive things that happen in the community and we as a community are responsible for, then this is also reflected in, in the regulation. That's very interesting. Where do you think the regulators' ears are kinder to crypto? What is the best narrative for them to hear? So I think the regulators are specifically working towards some goals. And let's say the European regulator definitely wants to um, come up with a regulation, with a framework that is supporting innovation in Europe, that is creating new jobs and that is making Europe more um, yeah, uh, competent or, or like uh, better in terms of like global, um, global innovation. And so this is something that they definitely work towards. Uh, but in general... Uh, crypto has quite a negative um, connotation when it comes to regulation and the regulators, they mostly read the mass media, which usually comes up with very negative news about crypto. Mm -hmm. So everyone is like, oh, we need to be very careful, which is true, of course. But maybe I can tell you what are the four goals are of, of Mika. So one is legal clarity, which is something very positive that Mika brings. Uh, not only legal clarity, but there's also the unified rules all over Europe. So which means that now you don't need to look into specific rules in specific member states, but there's a European regulate. Rules. Okay, yeah, exactly. A European right. framework. Then the other one is to protect consumers. So this is their own, like th their very important uh, concern. Sorry, also tax wise. Uh, tax wise, it's. It's not regulated in Mika, but there okay. are initiatives that are looking into taxation. Uh, taxation is something that is regulated on the member state basis, mm -hmm. but there is a new directive that is discussed about, and basically it's, it brings new rules on how to more effectively communicate between member states when it comes to taxation, okay, interesting. especially in crypto. And so the other, the other one is like protecting consumers and then uh, supporting innovation. And of course, the most interesting one, and I think it's quite specific to crypto, is, um, is protect the financial stability of Europe. And what this means, we have a very concrete outcome from this, which means the stablecoin regulation that we have in Mika, which is very, very heavy and basically prohibits decentralized stablecoins and puts a cap, a limit on how many transactions per day can be done by a non-euro denominated stablecoin in payments. We saw UNICEF and other international institutions engaging into crypto over the last couple of years on multiple levels. What do you think will be um, EU's first adoption case or uh, 
the first gate that somehow will open towards uh, an institutional adoption of crypto at a European uh, framework. So Europe and especially the Parliament started, started very early in 2017-18 to look into blockchain and see what could be the applications there. And I think that the first one will definitely be identity. So they are working on this for years already. And I think it, it's a very important question that we need to solve in crypto in general. But I think it's also a good use case that could come from the like intersection of crypto and uh, and and the state in a way so that is that is the first one as a crypto lawyer where do you think defi protocols nft dapps governance protocols should put their attention more so we're not giving financial legal advice of course <laughs> never <laughs> but i think what's uh, in a way what's important at least this was my personal Path, and I think maybe all of us are going through this is kind of grow up <laughs> as an industry and try to understand more about maybe other other groups other institutions or just like the forces that are also influencing how we evolve and and what is basically possible to do with crypto um, and I think that the ones that you mentioned if we're thinking about specifically decentralized use cases what i can do what i can say from the european point of view is that the markets and crypto assets regulation specifically says decentralized finance decentralized use cases are outside of the scope of mika because it was impossible to regulate it with the same mentality that we regulate for example uh, financial institutions because this is the in a way the the idea that they took for mika but it also says that only partially decentralized projects are not exempt so I think it's just forcing us to think more about decentralization and think more about are we really achieving it on all the levels, like on the technical governance, uh, application, etc. level. And um, yeah, trying to, 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 make it, to make it better and, and to be better in, in how are we executing those things. Who are uh, European crypto initiatives competitors at Bruxelles level? Who's pushing the waves against you? Mm -hmm against your efforts? I think that it's hard to say, but probably, you know, somebody that doesn't have an interest in crypto being uh, very much involved in, in, the, in the financial in industry that we know of today. Um, what is very interesting, I can share an anecdote that we had, I think it was like a year and a half ago. We shared some feedback for Mika and almost all of our suggestions were accepted in the in the draft in that draft at that moment and we were like really happy and we see that you know our work has an impact but then there was another draft in a month and basically the biggest part of them were deleted or even replaced which much uh, more, I would say, stringent regulation on decentralized uh, or, or, or kind of a blockchain applications. So there's definitely different forces that are influencing um, the, the, the minds of regulators. Um, some advisors that are advising, I would say, financial regulators for years, also doing this now in crypto and kind of thinking in the same way as they were regulating something that was centralized and, you know, trying to, to convey the same message to the regulators today. And I think that we just need to be more active and, and, and try to, you know, to share the, the message and the knowledge to everyone. Coming to um, kind of a hot case right now in Europe, can you give us some insights or some updates on Alex, uh, Pert7, Tornado Cash case in the, in the Netherlands? That was definitely one of the most important events that happened this year in general, I would say in crypto. And what we see in Europe was the arrest of Alexei. The, the problem here is that we, I wouldn't know how to comment it at the moment because we don't know what are the charges. Of course, something was published online. Uh, but we don't know officially what are the charges. And I know that there's a lot of people working on this um, and, 
in a way still waiting until we get this uh, this information and I think we should get it very soon which is actually a news how many days have been without charges almost a hundred I guess yeah I think it's a hundred or hundred and something maximum yeah I was talking to some some people from the Netherlands that are working and, and following this case closely and I think that that happened in August so we should have some news right now very soon um, and I think it's it's again it's really hard to comment before we get this news but I think it's it's just like again making us think about how can this influence the the crypto community and especially decentralization and open source try, code exactly trying to understand how to move forward I would say that I'm speculating because I don't have information but I would say that most probably it's it was not only because of writing open source code um, I hope yeah. that is not the case, and and I I, I would say I'm quite certain that might not be the case. Okay, what is the future of the European Crypto Initiative, both at internal, structural, and uh, external agenda? So, internally, I think we need to grow more. We need to have more people. Uh, again, as an example, when we saw some. Um, amendments that are usually written by the MPs, so by the parliament, they can have also like 1,000 pages. And and for I remember for Mika, we went through all of them and we were just having like a really long Excel file and saying, oh, this was done, you know, this was written by this MP and then just saying it's negative, neutral or positive to mm. what we want to do. So it's taking a lot of time just to, you know, read, understand, give feedback. And so that would that would immensely help us. And I think that this is also how we can achieve uh, the goal of being more proactive and not just reactive to the regulation that is happening and to the events that are happening. So, for example, what we're looking forward and what would happen in Europe is probably kind of an idea around a regulation on NFTs, a regulation on DeFi um, and some other similar things. Now we have the AML package. So those are all the things that require a lot of thought and and even us to lead the, the conversation in a way. So regroup, think about what do we want to do? How do we want to, you know, what are the principles that could lead the, the regulation on DeFi? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that this is really the, the, the most value that we can provide as an organization. Um, and also what we are recently doing is looking into the international organizations and what they do. And there's a lot of reports that are coming up on DeFi in the next months and years. And I think that this is also very important to understand because it will have an effect on the local regulators then. Okay. So how could the web free community help your work by maybe publishing legal papers along white papers? Is there any practice that would make uh, the European crypto initiatives work uh, easier? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a lot of different ways. Um, so we are growing our team. That's the first thing. So, you know, we need contributors, but at the same time, we also need finances. So new members and new supporters, financial supporters. Then I think what is very important is to bring people that have ideas on how to, again, regulate or solve certain problems, coming together and discussing and, and basically working on those papers, positions and, and putting them forward. And then I think what is also very important is everyone thinking about, again, the narrative that crypto has and how to improve it, but also maybe how to self, in a way, regulate or at least self-control. So things like um, Terra Luna collapse would not happen because all of those things have a very negative impact on, on what we do and on the whole community, unfortunately. And another thing that we mentioned in our talk at DEF CON is that um, there's a lot of crossroads that we have in front of us right now as a community because of the regulators. They're kind of challenging us, but I think it's also good because we need to look, you know, internally in the community and, and, and think and decide what should we do? What do we want to do? Have we, have we asked ourselves the most important questions and the hardest questions? I think this year was especially interesting because of the fork within the Ethereum community, also because of the tornado cache and, and different events that influenced all the, the layer ones. And I think that 
a thing that we would want to do as EUCI is be neutral to the point that we want to represent the really the open source values, but they are reflected in all the blockchains and they can also be reflected in centralized entities mm -hmm. because they are in a way a part of everything that is happening in, in, in this space. So I think that in the future, it's not only going to be, as you asked before, who, who ha kind of has different interests, um, you know, when you look into, into crypto, but also in the crypto community, there are like small communities that might have different preferences and different ideas on how we want to move forward. Mm -hmm. So what's your mid-term um, external agenda? Is there any deadlines that you're pursuing right now in the next six months, year? Yeah, definitely. So the, the agenda is to be responsive to what's happening on the regulatory side. Mm -hmm. So this is happening like on the EU level right now. We are negotiating the AML regulation and the other documents from the AML package. So we are talking to the regulators about that. There's probably going to be new documentation on NFTs or even metaverse uh, coming up. And there is also a very, very important thing that I don't think has been discussed enough. There is a new data act in Europe that usually regulates just data, um, personal and, and data that is not personal, but it has this article 30, I think, that regulates also smart contracts and how smart contracts need to be designed in order to be compliant with this, uh, with this data Ooh. act. And there is a big problem because it basically says that it needs to be designed in a way that it can be stopped. Uh, wow. So, okay. yeah. This is a big scoop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to digest or to respond to that. So I'll leave it to the, to the audience. <laughs> okay, let's end on a, on a pleasant note. So do you think with free will eventually wash away lawyers or uh, it will take more than that? <laughs> so... I think it's maybe I, I'm, I'm, I'm responding with questions like, do we want to wash away lawyers? Me not. Uh, or you know, which kind it's, of it's lawyers? It's like the joke usually you want. <laughs> no, 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 but that's good. And I think that really the most important question is when I talk to projects is like, what do you think about the state? And what do yeah. you think about like those institutions that are basically in a way governing how we live? And I think that if ev everyone responds to these questions like personally, I think it, it's very helpful to help you build the, the strategy on how to, to move forward. But I would also encourage everyone to be, I would say, quite, quite in a way um, rational when, when, when trying to, to predict the future. Marina, I thank you very much for being here today for Defined Podcast and uh, wish you a good time here in Lisbon. Thank you so much.